It was about searching and handling portable software. And then in 2015, I summarized how Mandoc really became the main BSD toolbox for documentation. So, and this year, it's, uh, it's another update. I will then tell in the talk itself what the points are this time. Actually, right now, it's uh, again quite busy. The last few days, few weeks, I've in particular worked on HTML stuff and man CGI. I had a, a very hard time for years finding anybody who, know, who knows web development front end. You don't find those guys in OpenBSD. Don't know why. But now I found a guy on the graph at GNU org list, and that's fruitful working together. He really knows how to do CSS and so on, and criticized my stuff harshly, and now I'm working on getting it to like things like uh, mobile-friendly development and so on. Yeah. OK, how does it look like? All here? OK, let's assume. So welcome to my presentation about doc BSD documentation tools. Forget uh, reusability, aim for perf perfection. Even though, wait, wait what, is, what is this? Even though this talk is not That right, surprise. The, the microphone is is switched on. Now it works. Yeah. Keep going. Let's see if it keeps. Okay. Yeah. So without documentation, code is unusable. And in that sense, bad documentation is about as bad as bad code. Now, the basic requirements for, doc for good documentation are that it must be correct, complete, and concise. And it's also important that you have it all in one place without long searching for it. It should be marked up for display and search, easy to read, and easy to write. All the BSD projects use or have been using the MDoc language for a long time, thanks to Cynthia Livingston for designing and implementing that language originally in 1990. And since a few years, all BSD projects are using the MANDOC toolbox, which is quite powerful, all integrated, but above all, it's free. It has no GPL inside. Light, white, portable, small, fast. So we're all using that. Um, this talk focuses on five lessons we have learned from the work on Mandoc during the last three years. But it's not about Mandoc only. It is also about SQLite and how we remove that from the OpenBSD base system. It's about LibreSSL and what was done in documentation there. Um, it's a bit about manual pages on the web, about the markdown language, and about manual pages in, in ports, so third-party documentation. Now, we deleted SQLite from OpenBSD. Why is that? Is it bad software? No, no not at all. Because it started as light. Yeah, well, it, I, after we imported it, it stopped being light. <laughs> <laughs> it stopped importing software. <laughs> I'll come to that. So it has frequent releases. It has, has about one release every month. And these releases actually make significant changes. So it's about, on average, 
15,000 new lines of code every year. And in OpenBSD, we audit the software we have in the base system. And nobody can audit 15,000 lines of new code every year in such a tool. So, um, but forking it, saying we do it ourselves in a more stable way would be an absolute waste. Um, upstream is actually doing very good maintenance and providing good quality. So it's the ideal software for ports. People can use it and rely on it without us continually checking it. Problem was, it was used in Mandoc, in the base system. So what is the root cause for that fiasco? It's a schematic, superficial approach to architecture, to software architecture that we fell prey to. It's kind of an anti-pattern. We asked ourselves, what kind of task is at hand? Well, we need a database. Then we asked ourselves, what's, what's the simplest and highest quality standard solution for that, for a database? Well, as you light, completely correct. So we have to use that, right? No, wrong. That's a premature conclusion. There are actually three errors in that conclusion. The first error is we didn't really require, uh, evaluate the requirements in detail. And if you don't evaluate exactly what you need, then you will typically end up with excessively powerful heavyweight tools. Second problem, we didn't evaluate integration costs. It may save writing code for the task itself, but you m might need excessive glue. And we didn't uh, evaluate maintenance costs, which was the crucial error that killed us in the end and forced us to start over. What are the actual requirements for a Mandoc database? Well, extremely simple. The only thing you need to care about is that you need to frequently read from a small database. That's really very simple. And all the things that a large professional database can do, like being efficient on queries that you never anticipated, scaling to huge databases for reading and writing, it's all irrelevant. In particular, writing is mostly irrelevant for a Mandoc database because you only write to the database when you s install new software, and that happens rarely in the first place. Also, uh, real databases are typically optimized for searching. However, searching for manual pages, you typically search for substrings or even for regular expressions. And when you search for substrings or regular expressions, you have no better algorithm than going through everything sequentially. Things like, like indexing and hashing just don't work for that. So when we um, found that we have to kick out SQLite, I designed a simple database format from scratch with minimal structural overhead. And I'm simply mapping the whole file, the whole database with mmap into memory. That is adequate because the file is small and it provides for very good speed because the, the buffer cache takes care of only reading, physically reading the stuff that we actually use, wherever it may be in the file. And with one additional trick, keeping the stuff that you are typically searching together, physically together in the file, you make sure that you read as, uh, read as little as you can. For example, the one-line descriptions of the manual pages, that's what you search through when you say apropos something, they are all just one after the other, only with null bytes in between. And when you find the string you are searching for in the 15th entry, then you know you have to look at the 15th record and find all the information there. So the lookup algorithm is really trivial. Um, once you have found, OK, I need the 15th page. You want to display a line, what that page is. So in the database format, you have an 
array of records, and each record contains a few pointers to string, one to the name of the page, one to the section, one to the architecture, one to the one-line description, one to the file name. And from that, you can instantly assemble the line that you display to the user. And if you want to actually format the page, you can instantly access the file. Very simple algorithm. Um, you can look at what the program does with Ktrace. Try that with a program linked against SQLite. Here, you see, at first it lo loads exactly three small shared objects. Then it does the pledge, it does the open, it does the mmap. You don't even see the search because it's all, there are no syscalls involved in the searching. You see exactly one access to make sure the file is actually there. You don't see the retrieving of the record. It's already without syscalls in memory. And you see one write at the end for the result line. That's basically the whole k-trace. And it works completely similar for semantic searches, except that you look into a different table. For the standard apropos, you look into the one-line descriptions and the names. And when you are searching for, say, function names, then you look into the FN table, which has a similar structure to what I have already shown. So this may sound like a solution heavily optimized for performance, but actually it isn't. It is optimized just for simplicity and for readability of code. And if you optimize for those goals, then you get good performance just as a byproduct. It's kind of unavoidable, even if you don't strive for it. So let's see how the performance actually changed when switching from um, SQLite to my homegrown solution. Well, the database size shrank by half. The lookup speed doubled. There is a coast. Um, the database rebuild time went up a bit by about 25%, but remember, you do that typically once a week from the ETC weekly script. Well, so once a week you spend one additional second. Sounds okay. The adding a single entry to the database is very significantly slower. However, it is still below um, half a second. And you only do that when installing new software. So you install a bunch of new packages, and it takes half a second longer. Probably OK. So don't optimize for things you don't actually need. Now let's look at the source code. I mean, OpenBSD is a developer-oriented project. We are already, always uh, care for the source code. Well, the source code shrank by about 99%. <laughs> It used to be more than 200,000 lines. Now it's less than 2,000 lines. And what is maybe almost as relevant is the glue code. Look at the two last lines in the, in the table. The glue code before was extremely ugly. It was C code constructing strings in a different programming language in SQL, which then got executed by the SQL engine. You don't want to construct code of one programming language in a different programming language. No auditor wants to read that. Now it's all native code. It's much nicer code and it's 300 lines less of glue code. So the immediate benefits of deleting SQLite from the base systems were 200,000 lines less of code to maintain, 15,000 lines of code a year less to audit, half the database sizes, double the lookup speed, and 300 lines less of ugly glue code. For costs, 
that are quite bearable. Half a second slower update time, one second slower rebuild time. Well, and I had to write 2,000 lines of new code. Took about a month. However, that code is now two years old and it needs almost no maintenance. Compare that to auditing those 15,000 lines. So the generic lessons from the SQLite removal are do not blindly use even standard tools. Evaluate your specific requirements, evaluate integration costs, evaluate maintenance costs, and only after that make a choice. Seriously consider using the POSIX C library. It's more powerful than you might think, and the additional effort to write C, pure C code may pay off in some cases um, because what you get is usually simple and maintainable. If the code is uh, widely used, it may pay off. Quality is multidimensional. So even if something is really good in fact, it may still not be good enough for what you need. And quality doesn't even imply adequacy. So even if something is excellent with respect to all its goals, and even if those goals cover all you need, it may still not be good enough. And yeah, Bob already said that I think light is a relative statement. So it might not be light even if it's called light. It's like smart phones. <laughs> I don't have to say it. That sounds dumb. No, no. By the time you have to say it, you're compensated for something. <laughs> yeah. OK. Any questions up to this point? I would allow one. No? OK. Yeah. Seem to be fine. Good. Oh, I'm not sure I should talk about that. But well, <laughs> you all already know it was forked from OpenSSL in 2014 after the Heartbleed fiasco. And you all know it wasn't just because of that one bug, but because of a general neglect of basic security practices. Um, the initial focus was on deleting needless code. After that, um, Auditing was done to improve robustness and security, and of course, the new libtls was built on top of it. Your dates are slightly wrong. I was the Valhalla commit because that was when I sent out the dict to Valhalla this week with the Viking. <laughs> that was the, that one. That was the Valhalla commit, and we actually announced it before BSD can. It's just everybody remembers my talk that I put together at the last minute. And I was kind of talking about that. Right. That's yeah. Thanks for correcting. <laughs> OK, so I'm addressing the documentation side. Just like the OpenSSL code was way below OpenBSD quality, uh, quality standards, so was the documentation. In a nutshell, the documentation, the OpenSSL documentation, is incomplete, generally sloppy, and written in an inferior markup language. So when cleaning up the code, there was this nice thing, if there is no object change, then you got, probably got it about right. When rewriting the manuals or translating them into a different language, we couldn't do that. The output does change. So all the manual pages had to be read by hand by a human. And there are lots of them that caused significant delays. That's why I'm talking about it now, even though the Valhalla stuff started in 2014. We did already have a good tool to convert pod to mdoc. Chris Dubs wrote that incidentally, and uh, it was very convenient, just in the two weeks before Heartbleed happened. And then we polished that tool in 2014, 2015. The main difficulty of that tool is that it has to, prevent, uh, to translate presentational markup to semantic markup. So here I have something that is marked up as this is bold. 
And then I want to put, okay, it's a function name. That, of course, needs some heuristics. Some of the heuristics was written by Christoph, some by me. And it was more or less ready in uh, 2015. But actually applying it and proofreading all those manual pages took considerable additional time. Why would you need handwork after that? Well, one thing, in almost all manual pages, you had many words that require markup and that just didn't have markup because the pod language is so weak and provided no way to mark them up. So that had to be added. added. Then often macros could not automatically be recognized. You can only do so much artificial intelligence. Um, in, in a few cases, the markup was just poor and wrong in the, in the original. In some cases, it was unusually difficult. For example, when people start messing around with callback functions, then documentation gets really ugly. So in principle, this manual cleanup after the technical conversions should be kept separate from content changes for the, for the version control history. However, both cleaning up the content and cleaning up the markup require reading the whole thing by a human. And we just didn't have the time, so I started also doing content cleanup right in the first conversion to, to get on with it. It still took a whole week to convert the last 130 pages. Um, after the initial conversion was done, I could start an initial sync with OpenSSL. So this time not working through our own pages, but working through all the OpenSSL pages. And then it turned out um, they didn't have a copyright and license. They just had one central file. And I had, for each file, I had to figure out who wrote it in which years and what is the actual license and put it in. Terrible work. Anyway. He also read all of the man pages written by the OpenSSL. Yeah, about three times by now. Yeah. So. There's a reason why his eyes twitch. Um, of course, while reading through all the OpenSSL manual pages, I brought in bug fixes from OpenSSL to uh, OpenBSD. I added pages that were missing in our tree and many other things. Um, one example that might be interesting to mention the decoding pages. What OpenSSL did there was just provide one giant page saying we have these 150 functions to decode DER stuff into our internal data structures. And they just documented the most formal aspects, the data types of the arguments of these functions, but didn't say anything about the content. That's not what you want in documentation. You want that the documentation tells the user what the stuff is good for. So you have to talk about the actual objects. So I had to figure all that out basically from the, uh, from the, the RFCs. OK, then you start with uh, maintenance talks. I'm a bit behind. This one is uh, an interesting one. I said you, in OpenSSL, you have large amounts, hundreds of public functions that are not documented at all. In some cases, we fixed that and wrote manual pages for them as soon as we detected the gap. But you can't do that in general because the OpenSSL interface, the OpenSSL API is of such a low quality that you have lots of functions inside that you don't really want users to pick up. And documenting them would, of course, be counterproductive. Some should perhaps be made internal. Joel Singh is working on that, removing stuff from the interface that should better be internal. So we couldn't just 
write manuals for all of them. Also, it would have totally derailed the structural work. If you have 150 pages to write from scratch, you never get on with whatever else you have to do. But there were some cl classes that could be done. For example, if a function is referenced from somewhere else, then of course it needs documentation. For example, if you have public objects, then you at least need constructor documentation for them saying what the object is all about. If you have analogous functions documented, you probably need want the other versions too. And so on, and so forth. And if the open SSL documentation was just completely wrong and misleading, then of course you should re rewrite it from scratch as early as possible. Um, there's only one effort so far to completely document a whole sub-library, the big number library, but even that is not complete yet. Yeah, we have to go on there. So uh, what is still missing in, in LibreSSL documentations, hundreds of functions are still undocumented. Almost all the existing text would need basic copy editing. Um, we haven't even really started the first pass of the OpenSSL1 tool yet, and the motivation but limited because it's not a production tool but a testing tool and a very messy one in the first place. And then of course uh, there are ongoing tasks that can never be completed like syncing from OpenSSL and um, changing the documentation when those guys over there change the code which they don't stop doing well. <laughs> Yeah, that's another problem that will pop up soon. Um, well, when you try to document LibreSSL, it's really painful to see how many different opportunities there are to screw up the design of an API. Here, in this talk, I'm only listing those ways to screw up API design that are actually perversive in, uh, in open SSL and occur over and over again. And the it's word is, I'm going to correct your English because your German doesn't get it right. The actual English word is pervasive? P pervasive. You said perversive and it actually was Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. <laughs> Perva yeah, I'm right. Sorry, though, <laughs> <laughs> nice one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, the first thing um, to keep in mind when designing an API is uh, avoid surprising the user and avoid being different for no good reason. So please do use standard POSIX functions. If you want to cater for uh, not so good operating systems, you can provide um, replacement implementations, but don't do wrappers, don't do stuff that is uh, slightly, dif just slightly different. Um, and if, if you can't do it with wrappers, then just accept the fact that on a crappy operating system you will have limited functionality. Don't design your API to cater f for the worst operating system you can think of because then everybody will suffer and that's exactly what the OpenSSL guys did. Um, the next most important thing is the smaller an API the better. So pay attention to the number of functions you expose. With too many functions you just won't keep up writing the documentation. It's exactly what happened here, and even though we now have a fork, the LibreSSL fork for four years, in a group that really um, cares about good documentation, we can't keep up. There are just too many functions to document. And even if we would write all that code, uh, all that, those manuals, who could ever read it? P people wouldn't be able to find what they search in a manual that is too big. 
So avoid families of nearly identical functions. Um, if you have several functions with almost the same prototype and fu functionality, make it one function. You definitely know that you have gone way overboard if you feel tempted to generate function names from preprocessor macros. Never do that. If you do it, it will be, it, yeah. <laughs> That's what OpenSSL does. They have, they have uh, whole sets of preprocessor macros that generate function names. Uh, stack off LHNU, look it up on an OpenBSD system. I, I, I tried documenting it, uh, but it's not really working well. Those are the trivial cases where you can avoid making your interface large. What is more interesting is if you have a really complex and difficult problem and need to design an API for it, then it's highly non-trivial to keep the API small. So that needs careful design and long thinking and talking to others, but that time is really spent well. Um, the same applies for, for object-oriented design. I mean, large parts of OpenSSL are kind of object-oriented keep the number of objects down, make sure that you don't have things that are logically the same on different API levels, avoid redundant interfaces, so choose one paradigm and stick to it. Don't expose two or three different paradigms for the same thing to the user to choose from. And with respect to these points, one sure way to find out that you have gone way overboard is when you feel tempted to introduce cryptic naming conventions like get zero, get one, add zero, add one. Then ob obviously that's the same thing. You should have one function for it and one paradigm to stick to. You will probably think this uh, list of things to get wrong will never stop. It's kind of near the truth. Um, in object orientation, never provide accessors that can break invariants. It's not a good idea to have a function set string length that just changes the string length without changing the string itself. Again, think twice before using callbacks. Callbacks make interfaces and documentation both significantly more complex and they massively obstruct call tree analysis when people are auditing the resulting code. So I, I don't say there aren't cases where you can do it, but don't do it uh, in each and every place like OpenSSL does it. Um, a quite bad one is when you have an object, make sure that you don't have flags inside that object that completely change the way the object works. And a particularly bad example is BN set flags, which caused several vulnerabilities in, in OpenSSL because people just didn't get it right and objects didn't get cleared up properly after use. Okay, uh, this point is probably one you would expect. Good naming is vital for comprehensibility. Um, you feel that very painfully when trying to write documentation. When you have an object that is a table entry, don't call it a table. When you have an object to store a value, don't call that object type. When you have a function that checks the private, uh, sorry, when you have a function that checks the public key components, don't call that function check private key. <laughs> it's, it's all real life examples from, from OpenSSL. Yeah, so this is the final one about AP design lessons. Um, I said you should keep the number of functions down. That implies when you add a new function, one new function, it's a considerable responsibility. You have to get it right 
with all the syntax and semantic details on the first try. Because if you don't, then afterwards you either need to change the existing functions or introduce a new one and duplicate the old one. And in both ways, you are substantially complicating the documentation and you are inviting bugs. People will get it wrong. And as the very last thing, I'll point out two areas that are particularly prone to over-engineering and to bloat, and that is on the one hand error reporting and logging, and on the other hand configuration and initialization. Just look at the LibreSSL manual pages for these two um, areas and you will understand why I say when designing your API to uh, take particular care to keep these two simple. Right. Any questions about LibreSSL? Not that I see any. Good. So we got to, we come to the web. Um, there have been about 10, not counting all the bug fixes and the small stuff, about 10 important improvements during the last three years. Of course, a number of them are structural. For example, cleaning up the C code structure to make all the following work easier to make the code smaller. Um, but also improvements of the quality of the HTML output and of the CSS connected to that HTML output. I mentioned at the beginning that I'm still working on that right now. I'm almost done removing all the hard-coded style attributes from the HTML code and relegating all that to CSS. But there are also several new features in the MAN CGI program. It starts with very simple things like displaying the name of the manual page in the top bar of the browser in the title attribute, or a very small but very useful one is that I redirect the, the URI to the simplest possible form. The benefit for users is that they can see how, which is the simplest form to access this page and they can directly type it in like man.openbsd.org slash pledge.2. They don't even need to use the, the search form. Right. <laughs> but there are also quite large new features. Together with uh, Michael Stapelberg of Debian, actually it was his ideas and he wrote the, the initial code, I just helped polishing some aspects of it a bit, we got an, a re-implementation of the classical Catman tool that's for bulk converting manual pages from one format to another. And they are now using that, it's uh, written in a client-server implementation, and they are now using that for the official online manual pages of Debian Linux. Um, a very nice one, a very nice new feature, and that really, in 2011, when giving the first talk, I said that MDoc gives us the, the opportunity to really exploit the semantic markup such that the user can profit from it. And that's what we now finally get here. We have the ability to deep link into ma online manual pages. So you cannot just type in the, uh, the URE, what I just discussed with, with Bob, but you can append a pond and a keyword, and it links into the place in the page where that keyword is explained. Of course, it only works for MDoc, for MAN, you don't have such information in the first place. And if you hover your, mo your mouse over uh, some word that is marked up, it will display in a tooltip what kind of thing that is, whether it's a function or an argument or whatever. Yeah. So, so much for 
um, for the man CGI. Now, one thing I didn't really plan to do was writing a markdown output format. We have a man output format, but why should I write a markdown output format? Well, one FreeBSD developer and one OpenBSD developer came up to me and said, there are those pesky people who require us to provide markdown documentation, but I don't really want to write markdown. I want to, I, I write MDoc anyway, I don't want to maintain two copies. So I sat down, wrote it, it took about two weeks, and the lesson from that is that it has actually become quite simple to write an MDoc, uh, no, sorry, a, a MANDOC output mode. It's always the same thing. You need a big dispatch table containing all the macros. You need a main function for printing the header and the footer. You need a node driver to deal with each syntax element in turn. You need a bit of stuff that is specific to the output language. And then the, the bulk of the code is just the node handlers, taking a node and formatting it. Always the same. For the markdown case, there were some things that were complicated. There were with output character escaping. That was totally horrific because the markdown language is so context sensitive. So it ended up being about 200 lines of code. More than 10% of the code is just output character escaping for markdown. A bit related is block nesting. So if you nest uh, indented stuff and tables and lists in markdown, it also gets somewhat complicated. That was another 100 lines of code. And admittedly, there is one thing that is a bit difficult in almost every output format. Uh, it's the horizontal spacing to get that right. That was another 10% of code. However, the bulk of the code is really straightforward node handling. And almost all the difficult parts are not intrinsic difficulties of Mandoc, but really difficulties of the markdown language. Uh, so a few words about Markdown. I don't think it's such an important language, but it's really notable for one thing. It's an excellent way to, to demonstrate how you must not design a language. It, it lacks expressiveness ex according to its own standards, which is make everything simple that could be written in an email, but there are many things you can do in an email that you can't do in Markdown. It's terribly context sensitive. Almost every to token can mean totally different things depending on where it appears, which leads to a lot of ambiguity. It doesn't, the language doesn't really know whether it wants to be semantic or presentational, which causes quite some com confusion in the HTML output. One of the worst things is that it's, uh, it's not really an independent language. You can embed HTML into Markdown and you kind of must do so because Markdown itself lacks functionality. So without HTML, you don't get some functionality. But then if you do, you can only use certain parts of HTML in certain contexts. And if you do use them, then in those contexts, you suddenly can't use some native Markdown features. So it gets in its own way. Also, the, the syntax is hilarious, not only trailing blanks are semantically, uh, syntactically significant, but the number of trailing blanks is significant. So if you have one trailing blank, it means a different thing than if you have two. Um, and because it's, uh, it lacks both standardization and extensibility, everybody designs their own dialect, which are, of course, all incompatible with each Listen to him, yes. Right, so the bottom line is never use Markdown for anything. And if somebody, f if somebody forces you to use Markdown, then just write a nice MDoc document and convert it with Mandoc. And thank Reich for the suggestion. So, next point, formatting third-party documentation. 
This is a bit difficult because you have not only to deal with nice FreeBSD or OpenBSD manual pages, but with stuff random other people write who have various levels of uh, proficiency in writing manual pages. Initially, we formatted all the manual pages in ports with graph at package build time. And then one by one, we switched them over to installing source manual pages instead as soon as they were, um, Andoc was able to handle them. There are three reasons for doing that, for getting rid of graph in the build. One is that installing source manuals allows semantic searching. The second is that you avoid the, de you avoid the dependency and the builds become simpler, the bulks in particular. And if we could manage to get, use of, uh, get rid of user altogether, then it would take out a complication even out of the built infrastructure. Here is a table of how many ports in OpenBSD used graph in relation to the total number of ports we had. Up to my last BSD CAN talk in 2015, the reduction you see was mostly due to straightforward implementation of new low-level graph features, but then we hit a wall. Um, in the 2015 Ports Hackathon, I tried, we only had 200 or so remaining used graph ports, I tried to get rid of as many as possible as quickly as I could. And I managed to fix 20 in a whole week <laughs> out of 200. So that was depressing. Uh, why was that? Um, initially, originally in 2009, MANDOC only had MDOC and MAN parsers, no ROF handling. Then in 2010, we implemented partial ROF request handling, but purely in the form of a preprocessor. However, there are some ROF requests that actually operate in a way similar to macros. That is, they permanently change format estate, state or they even produce output directly and there are some people, not many, but some people crazy enough to use them. And, and that's the wall we hit. So what was required was an extensive reorganization of most of the Mandoc parsers and most of the Mandoc data structures to allow generating syntax tree nodes in the ROF preprocessor. That took more than two years working on it on and off, not all the two years, of course, but several times. Once that was done, we, of course, had to write a small framework for actually getting terminal and HTML output from those ROF nodes. And once that was done, we could start actually implementing the functionality. So I moved a few ROF requests that were in the MAN parser over to the new ROF parser infrastructure. And then I implemented several requests that change state visible to the formatters. Those are mostly about tabbing and adjustment, horizontal adjustment. I implemented several low-level ROF requests and escape sequences that actually produce output. And after that, it became worthwhile to also implement those missing requests that only operate on the preprocessor level. So that solved about half of that problem after two years of work. Um, the other half, or a bit less than the other half, is related to table. And most of that, not all, but most of that was related to filling text inside table columns. The problem here is that filling text, so finding line breaks, is already the most difficult part of the terminal formatter in Mandoc, and it was hard-coded to only handle one column at a time. 
But in a table, you need to do several columns in parallel. So that needed quite a bit of reorganization in the table um, parser and formatter. And I also implemented a few missing features there that are not so difficult and interesting. However, after these two things was, were done, the parser reorganization itself and the TBL improvements, suddenly, within two months, I was able to get down from more than 200 remaining use graph ports to below 30. Yeah. So, those were the five big chapters. Now we get... Yes. It varies. I would say about it, uh, among these remaining 28 or so ports that still need use graph, there are about 50 different reasons why. And I would guess that about 35 of them are really stupid. <laughs> but there are probably also five to 10 that makes some sense. For example, one thing that is still missing is the ability to use macros, high-level macros, inside a table. Like, you might want to mention a function name or an argument name inside a table that actually makes sense. Another thing is, you might, uh, you, sometimes you are measuring the width of a string, and that depends on the font. So if it's a bold string, then it will be wider than that also makes kind of sense. It is extremely difficult to implement in Mandoc. So, yeah, it's, it's a mixture. Right, so regarding all the small things, uh, I didn't call my talk just, just forget reusability, but also strive for perfection. Um, there are lots of things that were done during these last three years that don't warrant their, their own chapter. One of them is that Mandoc isn't an isolated project. We are not just maintaining the Mandoc toolbox, but we are also maintaining the MDoc language. And there is another Maya implementation of the MDoc language. The original one from Cynthia is only used by Heirloom now, that's not so important. But the graph implementation by Werner Lemberg is really important. So when we want to move on, improve the language, then we really have to implement the stuff both in Mandoc and in graph. And in some cases, that's just what I did. For example, I vastly improved the quality of ASCII output of mathematical symbols. And I did that both in Mandoc and in Groff. For example, I completely re rewrote the hyperlink LK macro. I did that both in Mandoc and in Groff. So on average, I have about one commit to Groff every two months, even though I'm the Mandoc maintainer, not the Groff maintainer. <laughs> there are even other projects we need to coordinate with. For example, um, I recently merged a feature from MANDB, which is the, um, the dominant implementation of the classical MAN program in the Linux world. So when you, when you say MAN and a file name, and the file name contains a slash, then it just works now in MANDOC, just like in MANDB, even if you don't explicitly specify the minus L option, that vastly confuse the Linux users who are used to that. Now, a lot of the small things you have to do are related to infrastructure. One is you really need to keep up with newly developed security features, so we implemented Pledge in Mandoc. Um, I vastly improved regression testing. Regression testing is very useful for portability testing. When, when I do a release, then I want to know whether it works on various Linux systems. So people asked for a regression suite, and I made a, a portable version that contains more than 1,000 of the existing tests. 
I further improved diagnostic functionalities, in particularly integrating the MDoc-Lint program with all of its functionality. I created a new message level for style recommendations. I created a new message level base that can do operating system dependent checks, so those differ between NetBSD and OpenBSD, and so on and so forth. Um, but there were also new features that don't really warrant their own chapter in searching the functionality to search for tags in less has been significantly improved in multiple respects. We have now Make What Is with its full functionality enabled on all platforms in OpenBSD by default. A lot of work was done on the EQN, the equation implementation, a complete Lexa rewrite, many parser improvements, many output formatter improvements. The, the bottom line of that is in pages that really need it because they are very heavy on mathematics like libm manuals. Don't do it gratuitously when just one mathematical symbol is mentioned in passing, but when a manual page is really massively mathematical, you can now use the EQN language inside MDoc without risking that it looks bad for people who are using ASCII output. So you don't even need UTF-8. And occasionally, even though we even have performance improvements, for example, Mark SP substantially improved PostScript output, made it smaller. It's half the size that it used to be. Well, what was done? Here in this table, you see on the left a list of projects. And when I announced that it would be useful to do them, and when they were finished, and you see what I presented in this talk, um, finishes one mayor project from almost every previous BSD conference. And you also see that not much is left open. However, that's a bit misleading. There are still lots of things to do. In particular, they were, just weren't announced in the past. In particular, we should do privilege separation. Parsing and formatting should not be in the same process. The pledges could be stricter. We should use unveil, so there's a bit in the structural. Well, then all the parsers have some things that are still missing. They are quite rare in practice, but uh, we should really do them. Um, the HTML formatter is under heavy construction right now. We should do similar things in the PostScript formatter. Of course, it's, uh, it's a bit different than what exactly it is. It's mostly related to fonts. A very large amounts of works are related to to foreign formats. It would be really great if we could do the same semantic searching in, in Perl manuals. It would be quite interesting to have uh, the same hyperlinking support in MAN manuals as we have in MDoc manuals. And of course, the, the LibreSSL stuff still needs a lot of work. So we are not, not quite finished yet. All the same, Mandoc has been stable for several years now, so a lot of systems are relying on it. It's fully integrated with all its, its aspects in OpenBSD, Alpine Linux, and Void Linux. FreeBSD is using it all, except that they still have a weaker manual page viewer. In NetBSD and Illumos, it's the default formatter, but not yet used as a viewer and not yet used as a search tool. It's included by default, but uh, unfortunately heavily outdated in Dragonfly and Minix. There are official ports for Debian, Ubuntu, Gentoo, PKG source, and unofficial ones for several ports and uh, for several systems. And the official manual pages of OpenBSD, Debian, and Arch Linux online.
are based on Mandoc now. So, conclusions about API design. Writing documentation is an excellent way to understand the quality of an API. And there is a flip side to that comment. Bad API design can make writing documentation almost impossible. The typical problems are too many functions, cryptic conventions, misleading names, wrappers, redundancy, inconsistent and surprising semantics, excessively complicated logging and initialization, incompatible RP changes in the past, and the resulting compatibility hack. So all that is to avoid. About the worst AP design error ever is auto-generating function names with macros. That's completely impossible to document if you make that error. And also callbacks are very hard to document. So if you can, try to avoid them. Some conclusions related to documentation tools specifically. Mandoc has now been the standard documentation toolkit for all BSD for the command line since about BSD CAN 2015. Now it is also becoming the standard formatter for the web. And that's due to its extensive support for, semantics, uh, for semantic markup and for hyperlinking. Mandoc now covers well above 99% of ports due to the improved RAW support that I've sh shown. And please do use the MDoc language and do not use stuff like Markdown. Finally, some conclusions with respect to that may apply to any kind of free software project. Do not prematurely introduce dependencies, not even on widely available high-quality libraries. First, evaluate the requirements, integration costs, maintenance costs, and seriously consider just using POSIX C. Don't worry too much about performance. If you aim for simplicity, use the right data structures, the right algorithms, then you almost always get decent performance as a byproduct. And at the very end, sometimes you need to be a, do a bit of optimization, but it's vastly overvalued. And very last point, I think that the success of a long-term project depends even more on attention to maintenance detail than on introducing more and more bells and whistles. So really pay attention to the small things. Make sure you get documentation right, you get error reporting right, you get logging right. <coughs> Don't fall for feature creep. Even though I'm the only person focusing on Mandoc development, and even though here in these slides I'm only listing those people who significantly helped since the last time I spoke here, BSD 2015, there are more than 120 people to thank for contributions, bug reports, whatever. I can't list them, I can't name them all, I'll just name those who contributed significant amounts of code. Those are Anthony Bentley, Michael Stapelberg from Debian, Mark SP, Baptiste Darussin from FreeBSD, and people who contributed significant ideas or other significant contributions in non-code form. Christian Weisgerber, um, Jason McIntyre, I don't know what I would do without him, Thomas Klausner from NetBSD and Joel Singh, um, who helped me a lot with the LibreSSL manuals. But as I say, there are really many, many others. Yeah. Questions? Was Michael. there not a motivation to remove C components from base? And if so, Yes, we do want to get rid of as much C++ as we can. And I, I mentioned that at BSD CAN 2011 as one of the documentations. 
I think what remains is mostly some parts of uh, it's Mesa in X and parts of LLVM in no. Parts. parts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, we were talking about base, you know, that thing that builds OpenBSD, also known as an LLVM runtime support that is used to build LLVM because it takes more time in code to build LLVM than just build OpenBSD. Yeah. Okay, yeah. In, in that sense, LLVM is probably a huge leap backwards, but well, <laughs> it's, it's a huge leap forwards in other respects. It's in the GNU directory, it doesn't count. Everybody yeah. knows what GNU means, right? Gigantic, nasty, and Yeah, that's that's what we came up with that's, that's in that's what GNU means in OpenBSD. In Cambridge, yes, yeah, right. Yeah. Right, exactly. I don't think, and other than that, I don't think there's anything else. And you know, Mesa and Mesa and LLVM aren't going to change anytime soon. They're really making history. Okay. So, more questions? No, then thank you. Thank you. Thank you.